This is a production of Cornell University. So, well, uh, welcome, and uh, let's see what we can say here. This is the title. This talk is based on a paper that's been published in Geoderma uh, last year. And I want to first give credit to my co-authors. I should say before, so you won't be disappointed, uh, I don't actually have any citizen science data that I've worked on myself. So the idea of this paper was the second author is uh, Miss, uh, Miss Liu, who is a PhD student at Wisconsin under Professor Zhu, who's an old colleague of mine who I work with a lot in China. He's at Wisconsin and China. And her whole thesis, her whole PhD thesis, is on using volunteer geographic data, which is a big issue. And she came to visit me here a couple of years ago, a year, year and a half ago, and we got talking about uh, could this be used for the area that I'm most interested in, which is digital soil mapping. And uh, we decided, well, let's sit down and, and write a concept paper about this, which is what we've done. And the third author, many of you know, Steve Carlisle, is a retired soil surveyor, lives up in Aurora, and a very keen observer, not only of the soil landscape, but a, quite a thinker about interacting with the different stakeholders. So he gave us a lot of really good ideas, and so we have him together. So it's based on this paper, and if you like to read the paper, then you'll learn more. Uh, to my great amazement, after a little bit of a uh, few weeks, it was then actually cited in a Nature editorial as an example of even soil scientists are thinking about citizen science. So it was like, citizen science is a big deal, which I'll explain in a minute, but wow, even soil science is getting involved. And they kind of took my abstract and put it here, so that was pretty cool. But uh, the paper has not been cited too many times, so I don't know if anyone has done much with it, but anyway, a mention in nature makes my mother proud, very good. <laughs> anyway, some of you may well know about citizen science. I want to give the background in citizen science, then talk about how it's been used in soil science more in general, but then focus in on could it be used in the more technical aspect of soil mapping, and that's my, my main interest. But let's talk about citizen science in a more general sense. Uh, this quote, I can't remember where that's from, actually. Uh, the idea here is the citizen, and we could maybe call the non-specialist might be the word. They act as either the observer or the experimentalist. But this is within a structure that's set up by the professional science. That's why we don't call it a hobby. And you'll see in a minute the difference between bird watching as a hobby and bird watching as citizen science, for example. There's a structure that's been set up by the scientists within which the citizen works. There are really two main features for this. One, of course, is we're greedy as scientists. If we can get people to make observations or do things for us, then that amplifies our effort. We don't have to hire another uh, graduate student, right? You know, that's good. But a really important effort, I think almost equal, is to bi build a citizen support for science and scientific understanding. Making a, a literate, uh, scientifically literate public is another main objective. And these are sometimes a little bit in conflict. On the one hand, we want this rigorous scientific data. But on the other hand, we don't want to make it too difficult for the citizen to get involved, to get some feeling for science. Uh, there's a lot going on. Here, Scientific American has a whole page with lots and lots of citizen science projects you can read about. That's an example. Uh, these are just some of the citizen science projects that are involved. So the Connecticut Turtle Atlas, people are interested where are the turtles, and they try to get people involved in this. Herp and, uh, herpetology and so forth, but there are lots and lots of projects. In Europe, we have a uh, whole Citizen Science Association network, and these are logos of various, uh, both universities, uh, such as here we have Barnmouth University, but also and Aristotle University, but also all kinds of NGOs, so there's a whole movement. Uh, in China, there's a, a whole page on this, and there's a lot of uh, projects that are listed, so this is getting more and more popular. Let's talk about probably maybe the most successful project and one that's very dear to our hearts here at Cornell because it's, a, of course, a Cornell example. Uh, eBird is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and their aim is to look at the spatiotemporal distribution of bird species. Mm -hmm. And what's the advantage from the point of view of the Lab of Ornithology? Obviously, a much denser network of observations. 
than could be possible at the professionals. Their aim, their scientific aim in general, of course, is understanding bird ecology. You know, this is in, in the broad sense. That's what they'd like to do. And the idea is, in this case, they're having the citizens amplify their efforts. Uh, this is their web page. And I didn't update this, unfortunately, I, for now. But as even a year ago, there were already almost 10 million observations that were made. And you can view and explore their data. You can contribute data and so forth. Um, there are all kinds of incentives you see. You're, you can make your totals. And uh, the reason for this is so successful, well, let's just look at this. Here are the areas where they've received observations. So they would really like someone to go up to Siberia, which is ver a very important area for birds, obviously. Uh, but uh, I was really surprised by the density in, in Mongolia, for example. So there must be some active bird watchers there. That's good. But you can see a bit of the problem here spatially in that the distribution of the observations is, is not done by any kind of sampling plan. It's all volunteered. So it's not as if we, and the example of Siberia is maybe a good one, you'd say, well, look, this is really important for migratory bird ecology, so we're going to do a scientific expedition. We're going to go to Siberia. We're going to set up a sampling plan according to our protocols, et cetera. You would have a very different sampling. Uh, you can't really tell this in the United States, but I had a student a couple of years ago in my, uh, my graduate course here working on eBird data from Chicago. And when you looked at the city of Chicago, uh, the idea was what is a good urban bird habitat? She was trying to look at uh, habitat that would be suitable from these observations. Well, you found a huge observation uh, along Lake Michigan. There were huge numbers of observations. Everyone sits there with their scopes looking at the ducks and the birds. When you got to the south side of Chicago with a little bit more rougher neighborhood, there were no birds. Now, this either means there are no birds there because it's bad habitat, or because no bird watchers like to go there, or because the citizens who live there aren't so interested in bird watching. But it's obviously, I mean, this is a, a nice example of uh, the danger, and I won't call it a danger, but a limitation of citizen science is it's very difficult if the scientist has to deal with data that is not a, uh, collected according to some sampling plan you might otherwise use. Uh, now, why is this so, so important? You know, why is this getting more important? And one thing, of course, is the technology. Um, the GPS mobile phone has, has absolutely revolutionized so many things. Um, you know, the, the social interactions of teenagers and things like that. But also, for us, the fact you can go take a picture, it's geo-referenced, um, you data capture apps and you can upload it very easily has, has really made it possible for uh, for anybody really with a very, very modest investment to get involved in this. And almost everywhere you have a, a, these, these smartphones uh, all over the world. The other part is this mentality. And the idea here is that we're getting more, the idea of the specialist being different from, from us as an ordinary citizen is going away quite a bit. And examples, for example, of, of reviews I, I, you remember you used to have to buy you know, the New York Review of Books if you wanted to read a, a book review. And a new book came out, and what do people think about it? You read that, or you read the New York Times book, book review. Now you go on Amazon, and everyone can review the book. And, and that's an empowering thing. And so many people are used to now doing that and giving their opinions. Uh, Wikipedia is a very, also a very good example. Uh, let alone, let alone blogs, everyone can give their opinion. So people are mentally more ready to do this. Um, so the professional scientists, how do they use this data? One is the massive databases, the idea you can make a much better model. You have more observations, you have more points, you can make a better model. And the example for the eBird would be habitat suitability, something like that. The other thing that can be done is now monitoring because people are out there constantly and, for example, they can report an event like the first skunk cabbage they see or, the, or a certain first bird or they can report a toxic, a toxic dump, a dump site, for example. They found someone that dumped uh, refrigerators along the side of the road. They can just go report that and if you're building an environmental database or a hazards database, you can, you can just do that. So you have this early warning and a time series, 
And these are both very useful to the professional scientist. Uh, now, that was a little bit about in general, and there are lots and lots of examples of citizen science, some more or less successful, but I'd like to now get to soil science. Um, what is different about soil science? Well, the first thing, of course, it's a resource that's v very underappreciated or unappreciated in the, in the common, in the popular uh, culture. I was interested, we had one of the candidates for our geospatial position come in and have these very nice diagrams of the intersecting spheres and the hydrosphere and the, lit and the, and the atmosphere and the, you know, and the soils were absolutely nowhere there. That was okay. Soils were implicitly there, how's that? And that was interesting to me uh, because the position was of course in the soil science department. <laughs> anyway, that was okay. But, but uh, that just illustrates, and in the popular knowledge then, uh, people don't have much concept of, of soils. Actually, maybe we have enough time, I'll tell you a nice little story about my, my PhDA exam. And uh, that was many years ago, but I had a minor in computer science. So uh, they start to examine me, and Tom Scott, who many of you know, said, okay, well, I'm gonna ask you some questions about soils and see what you know. So please write down the orders of soil taxonomy, and then we'll talk about them. So I'm about to write on the board, and the computer science professor interrupts. He says, wait, wait, wait. You just used the word taxonomy. Is that like a classification? I said, yes. He said, you mean you can classify soils? Yes, you mean soils are, are, are different? I mean, are there differences? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I knew where the professor lived in Coy Glen, and I could specifically tell him about the different lacustrine soils, where his house was, and the terrace soils right across the road in the Coy Glen quarry, so I could illustrate to them there were some differences and we had a nice A exam. But, <laughs> but I always thought it was a nice example of a very intelligent, very well informed person about many things not appreciating soils. Okay. Second point is even people that know about soils, I, I don't think we have any soil hobbyists. I've never heard of anyone who goes out and looks at soils for a hobby. Uh, you could. You could go around you say I want to have seen every order in soil taxonomy. I mean that could be a hobby but I've never heard of it. So I was on a pedology tour and there were two students from the University of Maryland who were like, finally, I saw an aerosol, check it out. Okay. <laughs> and one of them had two of the texture triangle on his leg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> you like that. But let's, even if that is true, how many birders do you have? And you probably, maybe some of you were birders yourself, they're, they're fanatic. They, they love their hobby, they get out in all weather. In fact, right now there are these two birders that have set up by this, the Stewart Avenue Bridge. I've seen them the last several days walking down. They're set up, I think they're looking for eagle or something. I'm not sure what they're looking for. A falcon maybe? A red-tailed hawk? I don't know, but they're set up there with their scopes and they have all their gear, so they spend all day there. Anyway, so we don't have, I guess the point is in soils, we don't have a ready-made group of people that already go out in the field and like to look at, at soils. Uh, a large group, but I will talk to Leigh about that. <laughs> Another thing, of course, very is the surface soil is the only one that's visible to the non-specialist, and even if you would dig, if anyone who hasn't been trained to look, to understand soil horizon, soil structure, and so forth, would not really know what they're looking at, or they, they'd have a very crude idea of what they would be looking at. Um, Therefore, and I also mentioned this, if you want to make a, a, a consistent observation, even, even of, of texturing, you need some kind of training. Uh, maybe a few things, like I can s estimate how many stones are on the surface, but even then, you know, if you've ever done that, you get very fooled if you don't use these grids to try to say really what is the percentage of stones, so it takes some training. Uh, so it's also difficult to have sort of repeat of similar observations. It's not like the birders where you, you go back to the same location. So there are a lot of difficulties. There are some citizen soil projects, and these are the ones that um, I, I know about. Um, the first one, and I'll, I think I have slides on each one, yeah. So the first one is from the British Geological Survey, and this is the only attempt that I know of to try to collect uh, point soil data that might possibly be useful for mapping. Uh, it's a mobile phone application. It uh, displays on the background the general soil type and it allows people to upload their observations, but I'll explain the problems with it in a minute. Opal is a very uh, impressive uh, uh, effort. 
This is funded by the UK lottery. They have a lottery in the UK and they take that money and they can give it to different organizations uh, based uh, th with, uh, that make proposals. And so they have this Imperial College of London has set this up in collaboration with museums. And they have all these, these, these surveys and soil is one of them. They have six surveys. And you'll see they decided to make an earthworm survey and you'll see how they did that in collaboration with a lot of schools. Then in the United States, we have GLOBE, which several people in our uh, section have worked on before. This was set up by NASA. But the main, the interesting thing here, the main purpose was to educate school children. It, it wasn't really set up by a scientist to say, I want to collect a lot of data that I can now use in my scientific project. So it's very important to educate school children in, in, in methods of observation of atmosphere and soil, but the main aim was not to, to collect the data. So here's m my soil, and uh, it's, uh, it kind of promises a lot more than it delivers. Uh, the background in, of, of Europe is the general soil map of Europe from the JRC, but the, uh, the Joint Research Center in Italy. But the one in England is only a, a, a very, very, very general parent material map. Now, why is this? The British Geological Survey, which controls the soil survey data, was the old soil survey of England and Wales was privatized under Margaret Thatcher and uh, told, we give you zero budget, you have to make all your money. So they immediately, even though the data was completely collected with ratepayer money, they completely kept it to themselves. They only sell it. You can't even buy it. They only license it. And they don't want to give anything away for free. That's now been taken over the, by the British Geological Survey, but now you see this extremely general map saying we're on chalk or on Triassic rocks. And that's all you can get as a homeowner. You can't see the soil map even though there is a soil map. So you can't go there and say, here's where I am, this is what the soil map says. When you upload your information, all you can say is, well, is it coarse, medium, or fine? And does it, you know, was it black or white? It's, so it's not very useful. They are getting some uh, people uploading things from their garden, but it's, I, I find it really a lost, uh, lost opportunity, but you can maybe decide for yourself. This is Opal, and uh, they have a, all these surveys I mentioned, and they, they have a soil survey. What they've done here, they've got a very nicely worked out protocol for all their surveys, and the reason it's becoming successful is because they're working through the schools and have this, they work with the teachers in the schools, and they, it's mainly school children, as you can see from the kind of publicity picture, but look what they're holding. See, they have a nice worm here. Are they very happy that they found a worm? And they learn how to describe, tell the different types of worms, count worm density and so forth. So that's uh, the main thing about their, their soil survey. And you can see all the things they've done here. Enter your results, results map, earthworm guide, and so forth. They've decided to concentrate on the earthworms. And uh, they've made really, really a lot of data and it very much more consistent. And globe, here is the globe. Uh, they collected data on soil temperature, moisture, and so forth at these various stations and then mainly through schools. And so you see this teacher's guide and so forth. So these are things they, they tried to get the students to, uh, to understand, but it was more a, a teaching effort, and I don't think they've really collected much data uh, that uh, can, be, can be used. Uh, okay, now let's get to narrow down even further into digital soil mapping, which is, which is my interest, and some I'm sure you know about this, others maybe not. Well, soil mapping, of course, is we would like to show spatially the distribution of the different types of soils, either the properties directly, so we'd like to map the pH everywhere or the uh, soil texture, or soil types according to some classification system, for example, soil series or soil orders. Uh, the digital soil mapping just means we use computer algorithms to speed up or help this process, and we have this mapping paradigm that goes back, uh, that was that McBratney uh, and his colleagues back in, uh, now it's already 13 years ago, so systematized and everyone uses this concept and how we work it out is quite different, but he didn't like the clorped. He thought clorped didn't sound good, if you know your Jenny equation. So he decided scorpion, he wanted to make scorpion, but he couldn't think of any I to put in there. So we have scorpion, and so he put the A in there instead of time. He used anim instead of time, so we could have A. But there is something new in here. If you know your Jenny equation, 
The point here is that the soil that we see is meant to be not randomly distributed. It's there for a reason. So it's based on the climate it's found in, the organisms that were worked both uh, in and above the soil, the relief, so where it is in the topography, uh, the parent material it developed from, the time it had to develop. Those are all in the Jenny equation. But here we have two other factors. We have S as a function of S. What is that supposed to mean? That's supposed to mean it's based on the actual observations we've made. That's why he put it in there. So you can't do this abstractly. You calibrate it based on actual observations. And then the N here is there for geostatistics. It's meant to say neighborhood. It means that if you know, if you know the soils you've observed close by, it tells you, you, gives you some idea of what soils you might find after you've taken these others in account. So it's just a conceptual way, but what do we do when we now go to actually use it? We like to find a covariate that covers the whole area we want to map that each covariate represents part of that equation. And of course, it can be a very complicated. I have a colleague down in uh, Flor University of Florida, Sabina Grunwald, and she throws 350 different covariates in a great big data mining model to try to figure things out. I, I'm not really an advocate of that approach, but that's, that's an idea. But each of those covariates are meant to represent something that would affect soil development. So for example, if you have uh, vegetation indices and you look at the intensity of the vegetation or the seasonality of the vegetation, that might tell you something about the, the, how, the organic matter, that kind of thing. Uh, so anyway, we, we, have, we need the point observation. I said the S was then the point observations for the soil. And we need point observations. I guess that's the point. We have lots of covariates. We have digital elevation models and derivatives. We have a huge number of remote sensing products, stream networks, all kinds of things like this, geology maps. But what we don't have, or what are very expensive, are making point observations of the soils. So the concept of how we might be liking to use citizen soil science here would be to try to find some observations we could use either in our model building or even if we built models with more reliable information maybe for the model evaluation, which probably shouldn't be called validation. I, I've been convinced never to use this word. That's why I put it in quotes because I was convinced by a colleague who I worked with in the Netherlands that a model is never valid. You never say it's valid. You can evaluate it and see how well it's performing and so forth, but to say it's valid is sort of like, you know, you have a validated driver's license or something. So she convinced me not to do that, so I've ever since been tried to be uh, strict about that. So we can maybe get a philosophical discussion about is a model ever valid? I don't think so. Anyway, so this is the question. This is what we got. Our motivation was to thinking about this. I just show an example digital soil map to just, if you have never seen one before, this is Arusha in Tanzania. And one is at a one kilometer resolution and one is at a 250 meter resolution of the same area. This is the prediction of, in this case, the soil organic co carbon concentration in the top uh, five centimeters. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't show the scale bar, I should have shown that. And you can see, so how are you doing this? You haven't been everywhere. Well, you've built some model, and you can see what's happening here is, as we go up the volcano, first off, we get more volcanic parent material. Second, we get higher elevation where it's cooler. The organic matter won't decompose as much, and so forth. And there are other factors that might, might come in here, but that's how these maps are made. But to certainly to build the model and possibly to evaluate it, we, we need some observations. We'd like someone to go in a lot of these places and, and take a soil sample. So why involve citizens? Well, for us, uh, we'd like to increase the density. Uh, we think, of course, just like the bird, just like the bird watchers or the bird ecologists, we'd get better predictive models if we had more observations. I'm going to get to this in just a minute and show an example. We would like maybe to c correct mistakes on published maps because if you've seen a soil map, what you realize is they're typically made now as polygons and the surveyor has really not been everywhere. They've been everywhere, they've taken some samples, they have a mental model, but they could have made a mistake. And if you have an observation where it's predicted to be one thing and you see something else, it allows a professional mapper to say, hmm, I didn't go there, I didn't take that observation, but if that's a true observation, I better rethink 
I better rethink my mental model and would allow them to then improve the map. Uh, another way would be to take a published map and, and downscale it or disaggregate it. So you might have especially a more general soil map where it's been done maybe at a scale of 100,000 or 200,000. You know there are several soil types in there, but you don't know where, but if other people have gone there, that helps you to make a more detailed map. So that's what we'd like to see. Now, society, well, Number one, we'd like, to, we'd like the citizens to have a good idea, uh, appreciation for the soil geography. We'd like them to know there are different soils, that they have different capabilities, that they occur at different places on the landscape. And the more people we could get out there looking at soils and realizing this, then we would just be building support for soil survey in a more general sense. Uh, so, you know, we'd like, we'd like people to do this. And there's this concept of the connectivity the, soil, the people appreciating soils and thinking as a citizen about the quality of their soils, the health of their soils, in the same way probably most citizens now are quite aware of water quality, for example. They, they're clear if their lake is getting polluted or if, they're, if they have foul-smelling water and so forth. So people have, feel connected to their water resource, but often not to soil resource. Okay, now I, what we did after that, my, my co-authors and I, we, we were really thinking who could be the citizen scientist? How could we categorize these people? Of course, some person might be in different roles. So I'll go through all these uh, different, uh, different types of people that we might attract to be our, our citizen scientists. Uh, all of these groups, the interesting thing about this is these all have a specific culture. So if we want to approach one of these groups, like if I go back here, you know, if we want to, I'll. I'll talk to the, the greens or the gardeners. If, they all have a culture, right? So if you'd like to attract them, you'd have to meet them with the culture, the way they're thinking, and making a, a project that's attractive to them and what they do. So these are probably very different types of people, and they would call for a different type of uh, organization. Uh, I mentioned the national culture here because uh, we are interested, of course, in doing this around the world, and there's a lot of difference between uh, national cultures, uh, both in terms of the citizens' uh, mentality, but also the way that people would take to sharing data. In other words, letting you on their land to look at data, or even if it's my own land, am I willing to share data? What are my cultural norms and so forth? And we have these, these other things that are you know, quite different. Scientists and the public have a different relation in different countries, so if you were thinking of that. Okay, so let's talk about the groups one at a time. The first one is, yeah, do I call them citizens? Now I'm talking about, this is the closest to us. And many people in the room here would fit certainly in this. You're a research soil scientist, but you're not a soil mapper. You're an agronomist, you're not a soil mapper. You're a professional in your, educa in your field, of course. Um, so we call you an educated citizen. Uh, so you're to some degree familiar with existing soil survey protocols and products. You've, you're aware there's a soil survey of a, if, if you don't know exactly, you have a general idea that these exist and what can be done with them. Uh, you have an interest in these maps. So you have an idea that if you're interested in agronomy or soil science, you, you really have an interest in a reliable soil map. You have a professional attitude towards soil information. So the concept that you might get involved in, in during your routine, your other work that you're doing in making certain observations that would help the soil mappers is not, uh, doesn't seem like such a big stretch. So that would be uh, one type of group. This would involve uh, not so much, uh, more just uh, figuring out a protocol that would not be too hard for people to do in the course of their other work. So, you know, a plant breeder goes out, they have plant breeding plots, they're out there. Anyway, what can you, what could you ask them to do as, as they're out there that, that might help you with your soil mapping? That kind of thing. Okay, now, the next, of course, are farmers, uh, or we might say land managers. It might not be the farmer themselves. It might be the forester managing a forestry block or a DEC forester, for example. These people are familiar with their portion of the landscape, and mostly they're definitely aware of the value of soil information. The motivation, and we're trying to think of the motivation here, uh, and the motivation for the first group might have been, well, you know science is important, and you know your colleague is working to make a better soil map, and if you can contribute to that, you feel, well, you're increasing the scientific project in some sense. Here, I think the, they're more interested in 
in a more detailed soil map of their area. It's maybe, maybe the other areas to compare land management methods, so maybe they'd like to have a more detailed map of let's say the county or a, a surrounding area, but I think the main interest is saying, well, if we can convince them to supply data, they would get back a more reliable map somehow. I think that would be the motivation to get uh, farmers involved. Uh, a big, uh, I should say a bit of a problem with this, of course, is, is the privacy issue in that in the United States, of course, anyone can look at the soil map and see in general how your farm is mapped. If I'm thinking of buying your farm or I'm comparing, but uh, if it's a more detailed map, uh, maybe, maybe I don't really want that information to get out. And that's a bit of a problem. Now, civil engineers and others involved in construction are an interesting group because they're the ones who go and see the subsoil. Uh, they have road cuts, surface mining, excavations, and so forth. So they're the ones that are already making their own geotechnical measurements, so they're, they're used to this. So we usually only go to two meters, and you know the reason that soil survey only goes to two meters? This is a, I don't know if it's a true story, but I heard back in 1899 when the Bureau of um, Agricultural Industry was set up, Milton Whitney was arguing with the head of the geological survey and the geological survey said, you don't, we don't need a soil survey, we already, we already survey. And he said, no, no, soils are different. Soils are the, it's this, you know, everything is happening in the upper part of the soil and you're only looking at the geology and you just call it quaternary geology and, and we're, looking at the, we're looking at the soil. And they had a kind of an argument and they decided that since bodies were buried to six feet, that would be the limit. So, okay, you can call that the soil down to six feet, which we now call two meters. So I don't know if that's a true story. But uh, in fact, there's been a movement in recent years uh, headed by the Australians for obvious reasons because they're in a very old weathered landscape to what they call whole regolith pedology. And there's just been a special issue in, I think, Geoderma about this, but a lot of papers on this where they're saying, oh, look, pedology is the entire regolith down to hard rock. This is all a continuous process and there's much more conductivity, much deeper in the soil than soil scientists have, have thought in the past. So uh, we would actually, and the USDA is behind this, NRCS, they'd like to look deeper. Of course, that's very expensive. Uh, you can't do it routinely, but these people uh, look at uh, quite some depth so they could be a good source. And here's a picture of, uh, actually this is a soil survey, but I like this picture because um, it shows an excavation that was done and we jumped in. We, we saw well before they, before they build the buildings here, uh, we'll jump in there and we'll take this opportunity uh, to see the, the soil. Um, and the nice thing is here, not only can we see the, uh, the soil where we're taking the, uh, the, the, the observation here, but you can see in the back, we get a very good idea of the, vari of the variability, which is very hard to do if you don't have a trench or a pit like this. Now, I can ask you in this picture, uh, which one is the professor ahead of the group? The one in the chair, absolutely. <laughs> well, he's taking, no, no, he's very active, but he's taking the notes, so that's okay. This is my, my work group at the Chinese Academy, the, the Soil Science Institute, the Chinese Academy of Scientists, Sciences. Take a lot of, but this, so it's not a civil engineers, but you see the point that these, these people doing the excavation, they have an opportunity possibly, for example, just to take photos for us. That would be maybe just enough. If, if, if we already have a good idea what the soil type is here, and, but we don't have a real good idea of the variability, let's say, of the horizons, if someone just takes a photo back here and sends it to us, that's, that's really nice. So this is the kind of thing we, we might ask them to do. Now gardeners, a lot of people think, well, the gardeners would be a good choice, but I don't, I don't think so for a couple of reasons. First off, the gardeners are just managing one very site very intensively, and second, they're modifying the soil quite a bit. So gardeners are an interesting group to work with for many things, but they don't really help us with digital soil mapping over, over larger areas. Uh, so I, I think they're enthusiastic people, and they're a ready-made group, but I don't think they're so useful for digital soil mapping. Now, People who go outdoors anyway, hikers, geocachers, these people who go out and they like to go out anyway, um, I'm thinking they may be interested in learning more about their environment and you might be able to convince them to do something as they're going along in, in their regular outdoor activity. We'll talk about what we might ask them to do. 
Well, we have the Greens and the organizers. The Greens, these are people that love the environment, even if they don't always get out in the environment. They, they love it somehow. Uh, and, the and the motivation, well, I'm, you know, I'm, today's St. Patrick's Day. I see we have one person wearing green, so this is good. The time I went down into Boston on St. Patrick's Day wearing my orange coat was a bad idea. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Anyway, well, Northern Irish are Irish too, right? I, I don't know. Anyway, but uh, the, the, the idea with the Greens, it would be if people are already involved. I didn't, we didn't get to think too clearly about what they might do. The organizers, though, are an interesting group, a really interesting group. And some of you may be in this group if you think about it. These are people that have a psychological need to live in an organized world. <laughs> no, seriously. Let me ask you, if you go look at a Wikipedia entry about something you know about, and there's an incorrect statement there, what do you do? Do you edit it or do you just go on and say someone else will edit it? A lot of people, and I may include myself partly in this description, say, I can't stand that there's a wrong statement there. Now, why am I taking my time no one's paying me to do it to correct, and it's not a, it's not a statement about me or, or someone I know, it's just a wrong statement. I take my time to organize it. OpenStreetMap is another really good example of this. Why don't we just let the professional mappers, why are people updating OpenStreetMap? Well, and I'm thinking in terms of the soil map, if these same people can be motivated to go look at the soil map and compare the soil map that exists with what's really there, they might have a compulsive interest in sending information in and I, I don't I would not downplay this because we see we see really good examples of this the number of people that every in the Netherlands you know it's just unbelievable every bike path with its width and, and its surface is in the open street map and someone is doing all this too much time on their hands too much you know they only work 36 hours a week so you've got some time it's not like US but they work hard in the 36 hours Okay, now let's turn the, to, over to the other side and say what information could be provided to us and how hard would this to be to get. And I'll talk about all of these one at a time. That, and you can see the list here and let's talk about them. Now the tacit knowledge is what I might call the local knowledge of the soil landscape. It's not expressed in really scientific language. You don't really make, this is, this is without making a new observation but you make a comment on a published map or a comment, uh, maybe on even an unpublished map, where you say, well, I know over in this area, it's really, really bouldery, really rocky. You can never use machinery over here in the bulb, this, you know. Or here it's been extremely high. I, I look at my photo, I say, over there, oh, it's really, really eroded over there. Uh, the gullies are everywhere. You, the subsoil is coming through. And this kind of knowledge where without making a new observation, the person who knows their land very well um, can either comment on a published map or they could make a sketch. Um, this is difficult to translate into point observations, but I can imagine it's, it, it's useful information. Uh, because we haven't looked at points, we, we've kind of made observations. Then there's opportunistic uh, newly acquired information, and you know the see something, say something motto. Uh, where is that used? In New York subway maybe? I don't know. Maybe here. All we need here is to say, look, if you're out there and you see something that you think is interesting and important to us, just send us a photo, just tell us where you were and send us a, geo a geotagged photo. We can see a lots of things from just a surface photo. Now, we have an idea already of what's there. It's not a detailed observation, but this can help us a lot. Uh, there's no protocol. The advantage here is we're not asking you to fill in any form. Did you ever get these things on the web where they say, please take a survey to improve our website? I just got one from the New York Times this morning. I, I subscribe to the New York Times. I like it. And I said, OK, let me see. And they came up and said, this will take 10 minutes to complete. I said, no, nah, no, nah, forget it. I don't want to answer questions for 10 minutes. I mean, if you're just asking me a couple questions, I might do it. But in this case, there's no protocol and no complication. And here's an example, actually, from me, uh, which I did. Uh, out one day for a bike ride and I see they've done deep plowing on this field and you can see these iron, huge ironstone, there's ironstone gravels here and then big, big chunks of ironstone. There's a tens of, I, there was one this big. What is this? This is what we call bog iron, Orchstein in, in uh, Europe. It's, it's, a, it's a concentration of iron that's been concentrated by groundwater. 
And uh, the farmer had decided, had this drainage problem in the field, and had decided to deep rip it for some reason, and brought all these stuff up from maybe a meter deep. And you see all this stuff you wouldn't normally see. And I went back and looked at the soil map, and uh, the uh, you have sort of two units coming in here. This is in the one to 50,000 soil map. But neither of them say anything about bog iron. Now, this unit here, the, the, uh, the, this one of the stipples, does talk about bands of iron, of thin bands of non-continuous iron that might be precipitating through the spodic horizon. So you'd have a nice, very fine sand spodic horizon with little lines of iron, but nothing about this groundwater iron. So this is definitely wrong. Uh, I don't know if the original surveyor didn't dig that deep or what, but you see the soil type is quite a bit here. And so this is something that I would, if they were the, if the mapping project were active, I would say, here was my point, here's the photo, figure out what's going on, and then they would be presumably be reinterpreting the landscape. You also <coughs> see here that the, the Dutch don't think there are any soils in urban areas, so they're way behind other European colleagues, the French and Germans especially, even the U.S., so. Okay, here's an idea that came from Steve Carlisle, and we worked it out a bit. Uh, and the idea is you'd have a map, a, a project called Improve Your Soil Survey. And the idea is you would, the citizens access the online map, which you can always do now anyway, I'll show you that, and displaying it on their smart foam or tablet, and then they can check the soil description that they see there with what they're seeing on the ground, and they can then report things that don't seem to match. Uh, Certainly things on the surface, coarse fragments or texture, things like that, you can easily see. Uh, and if there's any discrepancies, they could either confirm or they could send in, they say went here. And the idea here is the professional surveyors in the NRCS, in the case of the US, would review this. And here's actually a, an example from Newfield. Uh, this is a published soil survey map, which is online. I, I printed it out very nicely. Uh, this is all from the, our NRCS, and I can print out the map and show it on the on, the, on the, the background, this is up on Irish Hill Road in Newfield. Um, you can also use, a, 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 I really recommend this location at the California Soil Resource Lab. They've taken the whole Sergo database and they've made it into something that will just show on Google Earth. It's super cool. So you can show the soil map on Google Earth, you can see the perspective and it's a really nice job and you'll see they did a good job also in soil survey. So here's this area, and if you click on it, you will see it's a Volusia Channery silt loam. Uh, you will see a mo modal profile, and uh, if you click on this, you'll get all the, uh, all the uh, descriptions of this. But you'll see that this shows the modal profile going down to almost two meters in the Volusia. But when you get there, uh, some of you may know this spot. This is a nat the, natural, the Green Springs Natural Cemetery up on Irish Hill Road. Uh, just before the Arnott Forest. And when you get up there, you will see that there's no way the soil is this deep and it's very consistent. In fact, if you look at their website and they ask, one of the FAQs is, can I dig my own grave or my own relative's grave? Because that would be a really nice thing to do. I could, you know, it's very natural. They say, no, because after you get to about a meter, you are going to be stuck by this. We need a backhoe because you are not going to be digging this stuff out down to two meters. Uh, so they're clear on that, and if you go and look at any of these graves that are open, you see here's the pile, and huge numbers of rocks have been excavated. So clearly, uh, the depth to the bedrock here is much shallower than mapped. And I think the solution here, if, if you would, uh, if this NRCS would look at this, would be to re remap that. I think the whole, everything they're calling the Volusia there is, 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 is probably not. It's, it's because it's much, it's much shallower. And there's another soil series. I think, well, no, it's not. What is it, John? It's not, it's not the Arnott. It's, it's the wetter. It's the one. It's, the, it's in the Arnott sequence, but it's, it's as shallow as Arnott, but it's, it's the next wetter one. Yeah. Yeah. So they could, yeah, no, this would be, it's like Arnott. It's like Arnott, but it's a little bit, it's the wet, little bit, one wet drainage class wetter. But anyway, the Lordstown there would be remapped as Arnott. And, and I think the reason they did this is when the, in, the, in the old days when they, when they mapped the counties, they didn't want to have too many soil series. So if they had only a small area of one series, they correlated to another. So these mappers may well have known it was shallower because Arnott is mapped, uh, the Arnott series is mapped a lot in the Arnott forest and in, in, 
and in, in Chemung County, for example, but not here, because it's still Tompkins County. Anyway, okay, almost finished here. Uh, now let's get to the more difficult part, which is the protocol-guided information. This is much more difficult than the opportunistic observations. Uh, you have to have a protocol, you have to get the uh, observers, you have to train them, and the quality control, though, makes this a much more consistent observation that we, you could really use directly. Um, you need a protocol that's, first off, safe. That's a very important thing. You can't ask someone to do something unsafe. Uh, digging a deep pit, and maybe it'll fall in on them or something like that. Uh, or they can make, r pull their back out digging, you know. I mean, various things. You really have to think about this. We're professionals. We're all covered by, well, some of us are covered by Cornell Health Insurance. <laughs> Others not. I still have Dutch. Okay. Anyway, but... Um, you have all this, this is all very fine, but then I guess my question here when you have this protocol division, you're asking them to, to get training and, and to follow a protocol, and, and really what's the motivation for them there? It's a, a little bit unclear for me to see what that would be. Uh, it's be like being in the volunteer fire department. Uh, there's a lot of training involved, but the motivation is clear. You're, you know, you're helping your community, you're working in a nice team, and so there's a reason you go through all this training. Here's what they did in Opal, and they have a 16-page field book just for the earthworms. They teach the kids how to do this. It's very nice, uh, but this is the kind of material you would need to develop this level of material if you want a really consistent. They have this, they have this survey step. They, you have to measure a 20 by 20 meter square, centimeter square. And you have to do things just right so the survey is really consistent. So that's why they have high quality data. Uh, physical samples could be submitted for analysis, but I'm a little reluctant about that because all of these issues here, finding a representative site, preparing the site, you know, the surface soil, sampling it, putting it in the bag, all that I just find is uh, probably uh, maybe a bit difficult. The last thing I think is uh, precision agriculture, and this is something that I thought about, I don't know if this is really citizen science as such, because the farmer, the farmer is a citizen, of course, but I think the problem here is uh, there's a lot, I mean, a lot has been done on this, but I think most of this data ends up being proprietary, that farmers do not want to release this. There might be a way to say, we will use your data to help us improve our map, but we won't show your data directly. I mean, there might be a ways to do that, but again, this would take some time to convince people. Okay, so these are my conclusions. We think that we could increase our spatiotemporal density somehow with this soil less glamorous, but there is a community of people, us, we hope, who like it. Um, and maybe we were, we're, you know, we're very attractive now, our environmental science major, more and more people are interested in environment and agriculture, which is good, and maybe our numbers are increasing. So then the last thing is that the citizen-science relation, we have to think very closely about the culture. Thank you. This is me and one of my co-authors. <laughs>